Sports' first Google Hangouts. Well, if that came on, so let me say it again. Hey, everybody, welcome to Worship Sources' uh, first Google Hangout. We have the wonderfully talented Andy Ferguson here with us tonight, um, going to be sharing some of his words of wisdom with us. Um, he's an awesome man of God, travels around the world. When you say world-renowned, most people say it to embellish somebody, but this is a 100% fact. Andy Ferguson is a world-renowned recording artist. Um, he is just an awesome man of God, and we're so happy to have him with us. So uh, first off, let me thank Chris Manis, one of our awesome contributors, uh, for setting all this up. And my name is Evan Grizzle, and let's get started. We have Andy Ferguson here with us. Um, so Andy, thank you so much for coming out and being with us. Uh, we're so happy to have you. Thank you for all of your help. We had a post you did earlier in the year, and it was awesome. Um, so thank you for coming. So the first question that we have for you um, is everybody starts out somewhere, but when they see an artist like you being just amazing as you are, they think, well, my gosh, they never, you know, they, they just came out of the womb playing guitar like, like Andy Ferguson. That, they, they just think that happened. So what age did you, at what age did you start playing the guitar? And when you started, what were your main influences growing up? Well, I don't remember exactly uh, when I was, when I first began getting interested in music, uh, my older brother had an old guitar from Sears and uh, just had a few strings on it. He'd taken guitar lessons previously and um, we had an old electric organ from like the late 60s, early 70s in our, our family room. <laughs> and um, it's kind of a piece of furniture, like everybody would go kind of bang on it. And in the family room, there was a record player, a huge collection of records, classical music, uh, just all kinds of different things. And I really started getting interested in music. Um, I'm not sure, just at a young age, but I, I really started uh, getting interested in church music, probably around the age of five or six. And uh, I was, my brother and sister were always listening to music, uh, washing the car, cleaning the room. And both parents uh, always had music playing. Um, Dad had, you know, an eight-track player in his car, listened to music. And uh, my mom was always listening to, you know, like the Gaithers or the Magruders. I uh, love some Gaither vocal band, my friend. <laughs> Dan oh, Dean, yes. uh, the Lanny Wolf singers, like all that kind of stuff. Lanny. And uh, so I was influenced by all of those. Uh, but... The first people that I really remember um, seeing in person was Larry Carter playing the guitar with the Magruders. Gotcha. Um, I remember, man, I'd never heard like guitar played like that in church. And, yeah. uh, and then Dan Dean, uh, man, he was incredible. Just come and play the piano and, and sing songs that he uh, had written. And then David and the Giants. So all of those kind of, you know, really sparked a desire for me to play in church. But um, awesome. growing up, all pretty much all of contemporary Christian music influenced me because there wasn't that much. Um, you could go like to your local uh, Christian bookstore, and I remember pretty much having all of the music catalog that they had. That's awesome. <laughs> and, That's so awesome. I, I would venture into. Um, I would venture into, you know, like the Southern gospel and the gospel stuff just because I had pretty much all the contemporary Christian stuff they had. So uh, cassettes were like eight bucks back then. So I would like save all of my money and uh, <laughs> try to, try to purchase That's like $40. Them. That's like $40 in today's money. So, yeah, yeah I understand. I, oh, but I, I really loved um, – I really loved one guitar player and he was playing on, you know, Petra and Russ Staff and White Hart and Carmen, the Imperials, Michael W. Smith, same guy. Uh, he played on like some of the commission stuff. And uh, it was Dan Huff, uh, Nashville That's session awesome. player. And he played on everything. Like he played on just about any artist that came out. It was basically the same musicians That's that, awesome. that did all of the contemporary Christian music. Right. So, they That's were awesome. uh, they were all kind of a big influence uh, to me. Um, you could go hear him on on any you know like the Gaithers, a uh, few good men, and then 
Turner and even be on Michael W. Smith and Kathy Chicole. Did Dan Huff, did he really play on, on A Few Good Men? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Because, you know, if, you've, if, if anybody has ever hung out with you for any length of time, you hear the Huff. The Huff. Like, you know, like, you know we talked to Logan, and uh, Logan is a drummer from back in Gate City. Um, for those of you who don't know, I grew up with Andy, so, so – um, there's some things that are synonymous with Andy Ferguson. One thing that's synonymous with Andy Ferguson is Dan Huff. You could be walking through the mall in South Africa, and there's a song that comes on, and he's like, Dan Huff worked on this. You know, and, and so you know, hearing you talk about him playing for, for uh, Gates Bogeyman, it's funny because, you know, was it the Rust Half album in the 80s is the one you let me listen to recently? Metals. Oh, my gosh. It's just this awesome, so just this awesome Christian music that, because Christian music sometimes can come across cheesy, and <laughs> that's it, it didn't like it was this, it was this big, just band sounding like these guys just out there just melting your face off, just awesome music, and it's hard to find, especially in the '80s, you know, something that sounds great that uh, that is awesome, and I guess Dan Huff is like <laughs> synonymous with Andy Ferguson. You think Andy, you think Dan. <laughs> he was just a huge inspiration, man. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so moving on to the next question, I can talk about that all day. But moving on to the next question, um, you know, you started. I know you started out young, and whenever you started out singing, what would you say that would be the best advice you could give to a, a, a younger musician starting out that maybe doesn't have the the talent level that they see people like you have? What would be the best piece of advice that you could give to them? Well. First of all, I feel like I don't really have the talent level. I'm just, uh, I just try to work hard, you know, whatever whatever that I do, and yeah. um, and just you know make myself available. Um, the first thing I would do is listen to all the music you possibly can, right? And, and create a music library or, or vocabulary, you know, in your mind. Um, that you can always pull from when you hear other songs or you're learning new songs, that kind of thing. Um, right. And make sure you listen to all of the, um, all the instruments and what's going on in the songs and not only know your role, but know their role in the song and how that everything fits together. So right. instead of really thinking as a musician, maybe um, cause a lot of times, you know, the more musicians and things that you have together, um, the less you're going to play. So just figure out where you fit in that puzzle and uh, and then try to fit in with your, your local band at church or or, um, or wherever that you're playing. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I know, you know, growing up with you, I couldn't have asked for a better musical mentor, but one of the things you always said, for lack of a better term, I can't remember the exact words, but it's a, it's a, it's a thought that's always stuck with me. And it was, um, kind of stay within your wheelhouse, stay with what you know. And I remember you talking about, you know, if you're going to play the bass, play it. Like, play the bass and be a good bass player or be a good drummer or be a good, you know, um, singer. Whatever it is that you're doing, focus your time. Because I remember I wanted to play guitar and I wanted to play the drums and I wanted to play the piano. And you always said, stick with that one thing. And, and I think that's one thing that stuck out to me, you know, growing up that I see now being a music minister that, people want to play and they want to sing and they want to play every instrument all at one time. But I remember you telling me and just driving it in my head that, that I just, I need to play the bass. I need to work on being a solid, good bass player. And, um, and I think the, the thing that you were saying too about, you know, we, you've been around the world, obviously, and I'm sure you've played with all types and, and sorts of musicians, some great and some not so great. I mean, in the eyes of, 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 of other people, I'm sure, but um, I'm glad you touched on that. Just kind of, uh, I guess, being a good musician because I know you've always. I know one thing is you said there's a difference between being a good guitar player and being being a good musician because a good musician listens to everyone else. Um, so I think I think that's that's awesome, very awesome. So um, I think the other question that I would have, especially for for music ministers out there or, or someone that's that may not be a music minister, but they're trying to mentor a young a young musician. What would be the best advice you would give to a, a musician or a music minister that's trying to mentor a young musician and trying to help grow their talent? Uh, the first thing I would do is be patient because it's an investment and it may take a while for it to pay off. Um, 
Right. And it <laughs> being consistent is the other thing. Um, gotcha. Teach them by example and be consistent in how you want them to be as much as possible. Awesome. Um, don't hold anything back. Like if you have some kind of bag of tricks or something, you know, in your arsenal, whatever that you feel like it's a secret weapon kind of deal, teach it to them. Show them everything that you can possibly uh, <clears throat> to help them advance quicker. And really what happens when you do that, you find your own self advancing because you're learning new things as well. So you keep advancing as long as you're pouring out. Um, and the most important thing <clears throat> is pray for them because they need that the most, especially young musicians that are coming up in church. Um, the devil really doesn't like that they're developing their talent for the kingdom of God. And right. he will try to distract them with anything and everything he possibly can. Right. So that's pretty much the four main things that I would do. Uh, just just awesome. be patient with them. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Very All very good advice. Very, very good advice. Um, so another question that, that we had thought of, it, you know, in, um, if, if you want to grow up and you be a preacher, one of the things you got to do is you got to, you know, ministers say they got to pray, they got to fast and they got to study the word of God. So they have like these spiritual disciplines that they, that they lay out that they've got to do every day or every week or, or however they lay it out that they've got to do to become a better preacher. But with music ministry, it's probably a little bit different because not only do you have to, um, not only do you have to be a good musician, but you also have to be sensitive to the spirit and things like that. So as far as um, habits or disciplines for musicians, what would be some things that you would say are important for musicians, important habits or disciplines that they should probably do daily or weekly in order to further their ministry, both spiritually and, you know, in the natural sense, musically? Um, first thing is to pray and and seek God for yourself. Have a personal relationship with God for yourself, because that's right. really the reason that we're playing music anyway. Um, the next thing would be to pray for each member of your, your team that you work with every week, um, so that you get along and there's no attitudes, all that kind of stuff. Um, Pray for, uh, I would pray for your music department, your music minister, your, your music pastor, that they would have the right vision and all of that uh, to lead and, and guide you. And then also listen to a lot of music. <laughs> um, awesome. Learn new songs. Yeah. Continually, different genres, Southern gospel, black gospel, whatever, contemporary Christian. Learn new techniques to keep it fresh. And um, listen to music for fun, not just for work. Right. You know, not just for church. Enjoy what you're doing. That's, right. that's probably what I would do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Like, a, lot I think times, it's a lot of times I find myself just listening to playlists that I'm working on, and I'm like overwhelmed by that. And, you know, sometimes I need to get away and go listen to, like, what we were talking about, Russ Staff or whatever. Right. Yeah. Enjoy enjoy it, not really be thinking about the technical side of it. Right. And that's really cool that you say that. And I think, you know, too, um, cause you, like you said, you know, you need to listen to music for enjoyment, but you, you, if you're learning a song for an event that you're doing, you're dissecting it. You're, you're dissecting every movement, everything that you're touching. So that's awesome. You know, that you, it's a good thought to go back and listen to it for enjoyment. You know, you may even pick up on things you didn't even pick up before just by dissecting it. Just, just hearing, you know, hearing the way they play together or something like that. That's really awesome. So um, another question that, that I was thinking, you know, I've been married to Ashley, my wife now, um, since December of 2013. So we've been, we, we've been music ministers together that long, um, both when we were in Mississippi and where we're at North Carolina now. So I know that it is, uh, it's easy to kind of get in a rut in that time because you kind of get used to, to, to what you're doing and, and your musicians and your singers, like they can get comfortable really easily and, and they can kind of get in a rut as well. So for musicians um, that feel like they're in a mutt or in a, in a mutt, in a rut, <laughs> in a rut you, musically, what would you say would be the first, like what, what would be the first thing you would do? The first step you would, you would take in getting out of that rut. 
Um, sort of playing off the other question too, um, and the other answer, I would learn a song in a genre that you normally wouldn't play even, uh, as far as, you know, even as a music team, you know, maybe do a song that kind of challenged everybody as a whole and kind of pushed you a little further. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be one way and then make it, you know, back to making it fun again. Um, right. have a good time, you know, together when you're playing music, there's nothing like playing music with people that you, uh, you love and people you laugh with people that you cry with. And, yeah. and in your local church, you know, if you all every once in a while just have to get together um, and, and just go out to eat, order pizza or whatever. I know we used to hang out all the time. So when we play music together, it was right. just so, so much fun. And it still is, you know, now right. since you're away, I mean, it's like nothing, nothing's changed when we get together. It's <laughs> even that much better. Right, um, right. But even on a personal note, like, um, you know, I'll never be like a real jazz player because those guys are incredible and have degrees, but I will mess around with trying to learn some kind of new song on my own and learn some right. of the te techniques, you know. Uh, right. and, and just, in, you know, wh why did you ask the question maybe? Why did why did I start doing music in the first place? Um, That's good. And when, when you kind of examine that and go back to all that, and review that, you, you realize, you know, what you're doing and, and uh, gives you a fresh perspective and fresh fire to start again. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think that that last one that's uh, really sticks out to me. That's awesome to, to kind of think about why you did it because a lot of people, you know, in in the in a secular sense, they'll learn an instrument. Maybe their parents make them when they're young, or they just love music, or they're musically inclined, so they decide to learn an instrument. But when you when you couple uh, a spiritual uh, the spiritual connotations with with church music plus the, the natural connotations of just physically and naturally playing songs like i think it's cool why do we do it you know going back to that that, that initial thing like why do we do it that, that's that's an awesome awesome insight so yeah. um so we're about halfway through sorry go ahead go ahead i was gonna say you know like some people are like you know what artists do you play for and i'm like I get to play for the artist, the right. one that created colors, the one that created yeah. all these things. And when I start thinking that way, they're like, who, you know, what inspires you? And the Lord really inspires me because of that. I mean, he is the reason that we play music. He's the reason that we right. sing. he's the reason we have a yeah. song. So when you start yeah. to think of it that way, you're like, man, I need to go practice. Or you start yeah. to get really focus really quick. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You know, because it's easy, you know, to get to get hung up. Like, I know, being a singer, especially, it's easy just to sing it, sing the words, and forget about what you're singing, or to say something and forget about what you're saying. You're just, especially in a church setting, you're just kind of doing it to get the to get the crowd to worship with you, or to get the crowd to worship God. So you're exactly right, man. I mean, it's when you think about it in the broad, in the very broad, the most broadest spectrum. Of playing music you're doing it for the Lord you are literally that is your service and your your act of worship to him so you know that's that's a good thought you're playing for the artist I like that <laughs> that's awesome um, so uh, moving right along um, we're about halfway through our questions that we have to ask Andy so if you guys anybody out there watching has any questions please comment um, uh, please comment on the video and uh, Chris is, is monitoring all that very closely, so he's going to feed the questions to me, um, and we'll uh, censor them and make sure everything's golden and we can roll right through and ask the questions at the end. If we don't get to your question, please don't be offended. We're just trying to, to do everything in a timely fashion, so please submit your questions. We're, we'd love for Andy to, to have some uh, questions answer of your guys at the end as well. So, um, so one um, question, and I think it kind of goes back to a question we had mentioned earlier that I had. Uh, what um, what would you say to musicians that can play multiple instruments? Um, what would you say would be important as far as using them? I guess this is the music music minister's point of view. As far as using them in a church, or as far as for them too, um, what would you say would be important uh, 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 advice? I guess for musicians that can play multiple instruments and play multiple instruments well. I guess is the right word to put it. 
I would um, first examine their strengths and their weaknesses on the instrument, mm -hmm. uh, whichever instrument that would be. Maybe, um, and also examine the the need that you have in, in your music department. Um, okay. And I would I would kind of take those two and that would be the answer. Um, so if if you needed a bass player, but he was really a drummer, but he understood rhythm and all that kind of stuff, and you know he you, he had enough skills where he could play the bass, um, and you needed a bass player, I would I would definitely put him on the bass, and I would really focus on trying to develop that because um, a lot of times. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of talented people that really don't develop their talent completely and or their gift completely. And mm -hmm. it really takes several years of playing the same instrument to know it inside out, you know, to be able right. to jump on it, to jump on any guitar or bass, keyboard, whatever, and it sound like you because you're constantly developing your sound and, and your gift. But if you focus on that one instrument, um, you, the, the best will really come out of that. And in fact, when you go to develop it, you know, on another instrument later, after you focus that time, uh, you'll know a whole lot more and you'll probably be able to develop that one a lot better. Gotcha. That's awesome. Uh, that's very good advice. Very, very good advice. So another question that we have um, for music ministers that, that may be frustrated with their own ministry or, um, they may be uh, facing situations in their music departments where they're just not seeing growth. Um, what would be the best advice you can give that music minister at this moment as far as being frustrated with their own ministry or being frustrated facing the department that just is, I don't know if not willing or just not able to grow at this time? Well, I've been there. <laughs> and um, the easiest answer in a nutshell is – it's only a season that you're going through. Um, the, the question is really figure out which season that uh, your, your music department or your ministry or your life, figure out which season that, that's, that you're in. And it may be a season of planting. It may be a season of mentoring. It may be a season of, you know, somebody else is up and coming. Uh, it may be a season of transition. And this can cause you to refocus and examine yourself, uh, examine, you know, why you're in ministry, all of that kind of stuff. And I think of the scripture, uh, Romans 5, uh, verse 3 through 5 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So in, in that kind of season, uh, you're really gaining patience with maybe some of the people you're working with or patience with God, trying to figure out where he's trying to take you. Um, and you're also gaining experience and hope. And I've been through several of those seasons and, right. you know, they're not exactly easy. I mean, you're like, why is this happening? But when you, when you re-examine what's going on and uh, sometimes I know one of the seasons I've dealt with, you know, sometimes is working with difficult people, focus on the ones who want to go, not that they're difficult in, you know, in life or even personality, just difficult trying to get them to move forward sometimes with you. Mm -hmm. uh, focus on the people who want to go and not really the people who want to stay. And, uh, and you know what, at the end of the day, when, when it's your time to reap, if you've been sowing, you're going to, you're going to reap if, if you faint not. I mean, that's the Bible and that's yeah. God's law. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, very good advice. That's, I think it's cool too, the way you pointed out to, uh, to kind of focus on people that want to move forward, not, and you know, it, it people, I've heard people say, well, we can't leave the other people behind. But they kind of do it to their self because they don't want to grow and they don't want to get out of their comfort zone and they don't want to push forward. Um, one of my favorite sayings that I will probably never lose is, you know, God's, God's ministry and God's kingdom is like a machine. It really is. It runs well because God puts 
every piece where it should go to make it move forward. If something happens and one piece breaks and just falls off and it doesn't want to go forward anymore, the machine rate may run slower for a little while, but that machinery is going to, that, or that, that broken piece will be replaced by something newer that wants to move in the direction because we as, as ministers, I know it's funny, we as musicians and singers and preachers and teachers and pastors, we are replaceable, you know, and, and sometimes we lose that fact. We get so caught up in ourselves. Sometimes we lose that fact. We are replaceable. God can replace us and the machine will keep on going. So that's really cool. You know, focusing on, focusing on moving forward with the people that you have that want to go. That's, that's great. So um, moving, I guess, less from to talk less about the ministry aspect uh, and kind of into, I guess, more practical knowledge for guitar players, because I know, I know growing up and I've seen you do it, you can play every instrument known to man, fiddle, uh, mandolin, a banjo, probably the dobro, I'm sure. I mean, you can just go down the list. So um, being a guitar player, how has your rig changed over the years? So I know, you know, I remember one of the, I don't know if it's maybe your first guitar, the, the Jackson, the, the salt and pepper Jackson. So from now until the pat, the very, very beginning, how has your rig changed over the years? Well, that was my third guitar. Third guitar. <laughs> but yeah, I still have it. That's um, awesome. It has changed, I guess, you know, you kind of mature in your your sound and your playing, I guess. I'm right. shooting for the cleanest sound now possible. No, what happened to me? No. Uh, <laughs> but it's always changing and evolving, and that kind of goes back to um, reinventing yourself and all that. But Honestly, uh, since I travel a lot, I was trying to find a great uh, guitar and a great, um, you know, great pedal board, whatever, that would be easy to travel with the guitar would be able to cut through keyboards because in Pentecost and church, there's so, so many keyboards. Uh, you know, we always get the short end of the stick because we're guitar players. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what anyway. think? Do whatever, man. I don't want to hear it because <laughs> guitar players are front and center now. I'm a bass player. They put us in the back. Uh, like, we're no, behind no. the front. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was always wanting a guitar that would cut through but be really clean at the same right. time. And um, so for, for years, you know, most churches are like anti-guitar amp. You know, and especially traveling, even if they're not traveling wise, it just wasn't practical, practical, you know, to take all that. So I used the pod for from the 2.0. I've had, I think, every generation except the newest. So um, and I've switched to using a, uh, a Tech 21 fly rig now. So it's kind of the same thing. But yeah, um, but it as far as that, my guitar, um, I've always looked for a guitar that would do everything, which most guitar players kind of do. Yeah. But um, I really, I grew up, my first guitar was a Strat, and so I'm always looking for that neck sound in a, in a Strat and always looking for the, the screaming, you know, humbucker sound on the humbucker and the bridge. Yeah. Um, but I really, uh, it's not changed too much, but uh, I, I, I pretty much have a set, uh, you know, set of pedals that I use now regularly to get my basic sound, and then I change like drives out and that kind of stuff. But gotcha. Anyway, gotcha. So, um, so, I, and we're going to be doing a gear review video on this. So, anybody that wants mm -hmm. to know more about it, we'll we'll go into in depth. I think we've already recorded the video. We're just working some other things out as far as editing goes. So, your fly rig. I remember, you know, a lot of kids started using pod, especially in Pentecost, started using pod because you had it. I mean, honestly, you had, but you start with the X3, the big, you had the, the pedal board, the X3 Live. Is that right? Uh, at the time, yeah. Um, I had the X3 Live and then the, or the XT Live, X3 Live, and then yeah. the HD 500. Yeah. Okay. So, so now you're moving to the fly rig, and I know that I've seen the fly rig, and the fly rig sets up with other, various pedals throughout kind of like it's, it's a stomp uh i guess what would be considered the stomp box on a on a full modeling uh a full modeling processor so with the fly rig does it just take the place of the amp is that pretty much what it is yeah 
there's a um, there's like a Sans amp, which is kind of like a clean Fender Deluxe kind of sound. Gotcha. And then there's a uh, like a Marshall Plexi sound as, with it as well, and it has a uh, a boost and a delay on it with a tap tempo and like a tape delay. So oh, that's cool. I mean, you can personally. I mean, you can add like a compressor and a volume pedal, and you're yeah. you're good to go, really. Oh, that's killer. Because and and for those that weren't there, I don't know if you can get the DVD, but Andy played with us at NYC, and he used his fly rig. And I've got to say, uh, I'm partial to your tones, I think, because I grew up with them. But your your guitar tone, I mean, your playing is phenomenal, but your tone is the best tone I've heard. In, in the church world, people mess people. I feel like people can mess guitar tones up really easily. And so your tone is amazing. So if you, if, if anybody that was at national youth convention and heard Andy's rig, uh, that that's, that's the rig he was using. It was just absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So um, I guess going from there to what would be, uh, this is a th I think a question we discussed last night that we, we didn't know if we were going to throw in or not, but what would be um, some advice or, or some, some ideas you would give to people as far as setting up their tone? Um, maybe if they, if they have a pod, what, what would be, Oh, another side of exciting announcement were Andy's pod tones. He's giving those to worship source for free. And we're posting those tones on the website. Is that as I just, my heart gets filled with so much joy when I hear this because we have Andy Ferguson's tones now. So we're going to be posting those soon, but for ideas, maybe for someone that doesn't have a pod or is using a stomp is using a pedal board. Um, what would be some, some basic general ideas to make people have good tones? What would be some ideas you would have? Um, <clears throat> what I would do is um, you may dial up a great tone, you know, in your bedroom at home, your living room, whatever, and it sounds incredible. But when you get to church, it sounds horrible, and you can't really hear it over the keyboards and all that stuff. So, right. Um, the guitar is a mid-range instrument, so I would really <clears throat> focus on, you know, maybe even like with an EQ pedal or uh, the EQ of the amp. Really make sure you dial in the mid-range. Well, and it may sound terrible by itself, um, but maybe take some of the bass off so you can push it a little harder uh, and, and add some treble to it. Don't be afraid of the treble. Um, I would really focus on how your guitar sounds in context uh, to, um, to playing with a band and playing, you know, at church instead of just playing right. by yourself. Because that's awesome. You can, you can die anybody can dial in a great tone I think uh, you know by yourself at home right but it really matters how it fits in context with what everybody else is doing right do, do you feel like it matters too and I know playing the bass I feel like it's mattered too about your onboard EQ and your onboard setup do you feel like that that your tones will probably change with the guitar that you're playing it really does make a difference, yes, because um, if you play with a Telecaster, it's going to be cutting and and a lot weaker signal and biting your head off, you know, immediately. Yeah. But you know, you can go in and take some of the treble off and add some extra mid range on it, and it'll be beefy and cut at the same time. So it's going to be completely different. Like a Les Paul's already beefy and bassy and mm -hmm. you know, like mid rangey, and so when you you know, you're going to have to do something or, you know, if, right. you, uh, if you leave the same settings while you're playing your Les Paul that you have with the telly, you know, your Les Paul is going to sound awful woolly and <laughs> nasty. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's awesome. So this is just a, this is just a question for fun because I've seen, you know, I've seen you play every guitar you've ever owned and I've even stolen one of your guitars. Well, I didn't really steal it. We traded. Oh. You regret it. I don't, I think you still regret it to this day. She plays like a big dream, by the way. Oh, it's, it's a ninety. It's a ninety-six American Strat, and Andy did some work to the pickups, added some locking tuners, and did some fret work to it. Um, like he had the next been refretted. It's a it's a jewel, and it's never leaving my my house. So hey, bring it next week. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll bring it up next time. But um, if you had to pick one guitar out of all the guitars you've ever played, if you had to pick one and play it for the rest of your life, what guitar would that be? 
Wow. Yeah, this is a hard one. Hmm. Which four would I pick? Let me think. <laughs> um, well, it really is tough. I, I grew up playing a Strat, so I love the feel of a Strat. And I love the, the whole Super Strat, you know, like the guitar you have and like yeah. my toddler. Oh, I love it. Um, and I love a uh, 24 fret, like <clears throat> PRS. Yeah. Um, you know, like my Peyton. I mean, oh my goodness, I love my Peyton. Um, in fact, I, I think my Peyton really it cuts better. Uh, it cuts better than my Tyler. And oh wow! Plus, it has twenty four frets. Yeah. And I don't know. It would really be. Uh, that's that's. <laughs> wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Oh, no. If you were a cook and you only had to choose from one pot to cook with, which one would you use? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not a cook, so I have no uh, clue. But. So anyway, I don't know. That's a really tough question. That's um, good. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I have gained a little weight, so it may look like I'm a cook since I moved. But uh, I'm not. Um, but it, uh, I think it's you know it's funny for a bass player. It was super easy for me because I didn't. Like, I guess music was, it was always in the forefront of my mind, but I've always done other things. So I haven't like taken all the money that I have and poured it into multiple instruments. So when I got my Lakeland, my, he's like, oh yeah. Huge shout out to Lakeland, by the way. <laughs> oh my grandma, 5501. It's a 2008 model. Holy grandma. Let me be honest with you. It, it plays like butter and it sounds like a dream. So it's, it, it, it's just amazing. That's it seriously is. My my Peyton, I really I can ask for a better guitar. Like that's awesome. For yeah, that was a custom one, right? That was that the one that was custom made for you? Yeah, I mean by Paul Peyton in uh, Oshawa, Canada. It, it's incredible. Um, the bridge pickup just screams. Uh, the neck pickup is real clean and stratty sounding, but full. And uh, I love love that guitar. Twenty four frets play. It doesn't get in the way you're playing. So I really that's love awesome. that guitar. Yeah, but you know, I, you know, it's funny. I played uh, the Tyler. You had the Tyler NYC, I think. Yeah, and that Tyler. Woo, I love that guitar, guitar too. It plays so smooth. But I say that about all my guitars. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like all your little children. You love all your little children equally. Um, so we do. Have, we did have a couple questions come in. Um, the first question is, Andy, what skills slash personal attributes are most important? to be a successful musician? Um, personal attributes. I would say to be really thick skinned and um, take constructive criticism well. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one that I would really, because we all musicians wear their feelings on their sleeve. I would yeah. really just let that, you know, don't don't take everything to heart. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Just take your take your music to heart, take your worship to heart, and if somebody's criticizing you, kind of evaluate you know where they're at and how how are they as a worshiper, how are they as a as a musician. Yeah, and if they're better than you and they know what they're talking about, maybe try listening to them. Right. And if awesome. they don't know what they're talking about, then yeah, forget about it and move on. If they don't know what they're talking about, come back to worshipsource.org and, and get some helpful hints from our awesome contributors, such as Andy Ferguson. Um, I think I would, and I know they didn't ask me, but if I had to add one to what you just said, I think it would be termination. Yes. Because, you know, like like Michael Jordan shot 10,000 shots outside in a practice gym before he could make the 30 that he made to win to NBA championship or whatever. It was an unreal number. How many shots he shot in practice to make it to the national or the, the global stage and make it, make an impact. So I think you just got to be determined to practice and, and to get better. You know? I, heard a, I heard a statement one time and said, picking up an instrument and playing an instrument doesn't make you make you a musician. Not being able to set it down is what makes you a musician. That's really good. And um, yeah. so that being said, it is about being determined and just, you know, it becomes yeah. it becomes part of who you are, really. 
Yeah, and you know we were we have this uh, a new uh, ministers class at our church it's called Ministers and Training Class, and a guy that spoke a couple weeks ago had said that it I believe it's ten thousand hours that it takes to to be a professional at something. You know, they were talking about like different people, Steve Jobs, the Beatles, who whomever. You know, the different people that have made it to the upper echelon of of their field. It took like ten thousand hours to get there. So, you know, they're determined. But you also got to love it. Like you were saying, it's, it, what makes you a musician is not picking up the instrument and doing it. It's not being able to put it down because you love it so much. So a very, very, very good stuff. So one last question before we go, um, and this was submitted as well. Um, it's a really extra very good question. How do I find out what I'm really good at? And the person goes on to say, I play piano, guitar, and organ but I'm equally good at all of them. So how do I find out what I'm really good at? Um, <clears throat> if you, if you play all of those and you're, you're pretty equally well at those, I would start with which one do you enjoy the most and uh, which one, you know, do, do you feel like you could see yourself developing, you know, in the future, even that much more? Um, and I would listen to, um, a lot of people that are more advanced and more, uh, skilled in, in that instrument and in, in all of the instruments and maybe not really compare yourself, but, you know, kind of measure yourself. Where am I at on this? And where am I going? Kind of get a plan together right. and, um, and you know, see which one do you really like the best, and try to develop that one. That's awesome. Very good. Very very good. So um, that ends our question and answer session with Andy Ferguson. Um, thank you guys so much for viewing. Andy, why don't you uh, before before we go, why don't you say a prayer over us and uh, say a prayer over those that are watching and and all those future watchers out there. Why don't you go ahead and, and close us kind of with prayer tonight. Lord, in Jesus' name, God, I pray, Lord, for all the musicians and music ministers, singers, God. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just be with us. Lord, we know that you are coming soon. I pray that we would use our talents, Lord, and our gifts, Lord, for your kingdom. I pray that you would give us the anointing more than anything, God, that we would be anointing and that we would be skilled in our instruments, God, in our church, God, in our community, God, that they would see your glory, God, and they would see, God, your power, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray for each one. God, lead us and guide us. Help us to do your will, Lord, and build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Andy, thank you so much for being with us. And all of you wonderful viewers, thank you guys so much for stopping by. Um, this has been an awesome first session and hopefully we'll have many more like it but thank you all so much for coming and y'all have a wonderful night